Did you ever wonder why Ishu stirred so many? And why the people were drawn to him and why he was so hated by the rabbis, the Pharisees, and Rome? You know, he, he wasn't teaching about the cross or his death from burial and resurrection. So what was it? What many do not know is that in the time of Ishu's message, the Hebrew language was actually dead. It ceased to be somewhere around 300 to 100 BCE. When Solomon's temple was destroyed, so was the Paleo-Hebrew form in the language. And when Judah was taken over by the Babylonians, that really was the beginning of the end of Hebrew. Everything was lost. The worship system, the language, until the Greek Septuagint was written. The Septuagint is a translation of the Hebrew writings, the Hebrew Torah, the Tanakh, into Greek. And it was something that filled the vacuum when the language, religion, and culture ceased to be for the Jews. All of the remaining Hebrews had become assimilated into the place of their captivity, and, and most of them either spoke Greek or Aramaic. And please remember, the New Testament wasn't written. They didn't have it. It didn't exist. All they had was the Septuagint. Although there was a select few that had the Tanakh, the Hebrew form of the writings, which was considered God's word. The remnant Jews who were in Egypt at the time were many that were hungry for the Torah teachings, but because of the conquering that had happened, much of the language had been influenced by Greek, hence where we even get to the formation of the Coptic language. And since Hebrew was dead, what they had to do as the wealthy merchants that were Hebrews, the ones that got out before everything ceased to be, they took their Torah scrolls with them. Because see, one Torah scroll was equivalent of a year's worth of salary. So the wealthy merchants made sure they took the Torah scrolls and to be able to help their brothers and sisters as the Jews were hungry for the teachings and all they had and really knew at that point was Greek. Some of those that still remembered the language translated the Torah scrolls into the Greek language, which was the birth of the Septuagint. Eventually, groups began to meet in homes where they would have study, and they would study the Septuagint. This was actually the birth of the synagogue. Everywhere that the Septuagint writings were delivered, a synagogue was erected. And this is how the remnant Jewish people became Hellenized. They were learning the Torah in Greek. Oh my goodness. The only people to have access to the Hebrew language and the writings were the elites, like I said, because they still had the Torah scrolls. The high priest also had access to them, as well as the Sadducees. Now, if you've heard a live stream that I shared with you before, the Sadducees were known as the Zadokia, and the Zadokia, that word actually is a word for righteous ones everything that we've been told about the Sadducees and that was written in English is not correct anyway. <laughs> These were the priesthood known as the priesthood of light that had established Qumran. And this is also the same place of the Essenes. You know, we were originally told that it was a male sect only, but it really wasn't. It was families. It's interesting to note that the name Essenes it's actually the Hebrew word, uh, it comes from Asiya. Actually, it's Aramaic, but Hebrew and Aramaic are essentially the same language. They just have different fonts. One is masculine, one is feminine, but the Aleph in, in Hebrew is the same as the Aleph in Aramaic. So they have the same meanings. 
So ASEA means to heal, and if I were to break that down in a translation for you and not exhaustive, it would be one that supports, hedges in through the covenant ring of power, bringing forth healing to the infirm through the power of unity. That really was the message. So back to Ishu. The question is, where was one of the places that Ishu went during his missing years? You know, the part that isn't mentioned in the English Bible? He went to Qumran. He was raised in the synagogues with the Greek Septuagint, but when he went to Qumran, he learned of the Hebrew writings, which the priesthood of light took with them when they were kicked out of Jerusalem during the Maccabean Revolt. You would know these writings as the Dead Sea Scrolls. He learned the oral tradition, how to read the code within the Hebrew writings to extract the deep resonance that is contained within those sacred writings. And as he studied them, he became them, the Word made flesh. It was what prepared him to be initiated into his ministry. See, the reason why his teachings and movement was so powerful and why the Pharisees were so astounded by his depth of knowledge of the writings is because he studied them in the Hebrew while in Qumran. Well, all they had was the Septuagint. And because he had the code that unlocked the language, he had a much deeper, wider, and a breadth of knowledge in these writings from the original format that they did not have. And all they could say is, isn't this the carpenter's son? See, the Pharisees became frayed because they could not compete with his deep knowledge as well as the love he poured out because they had become too puffed up in their head knowledge as the Septuagint in the Greek language doesn't deal with matters of the heart. And because such, <laughs> their hearts remained as stone. The Chaldean flame letters, the ancient form of Hebrew, is what the original scrolls were written in. Chaldean is the Greek name for Akkadian, and Akkadian was the language spoken in Babylon during the time of Nimrod, where they had one language that unified them all. There was nothing that they couldn't do because they were all unified as one through the language of light, love. This language sprang up from Sumer, and then it was scattered. Babel, by the way, means confusion. Question, do you think it's a coincidence that Bible is similar in sound to the word Babel? So the Semitic languages are very consonant driven. So both of these words would be transliter transliterated in English as B, B, L, Bible, Babel. confusion. Ishu brought the inheritance of the language back to the people in teaching them the way through the flame letters, the language that is all about love, unity, and light that brings healing from separation, which is the wounded ego. It led a rebellion that was throwing off the chains of government control and religion, religious bondage. People were rising up in their spiritual sovereignty, no longer needing the government or religion to govern their minds. They were rising up out of their slumber, awakening to their divinity. And this is why Rome had to put an end to this rebellion and why the religious system was in on it as well. The loss of the control of people. They had too much to lose if this way was allowed to continue. And by the time 70 CE rolled around, all had been destroyed. All remnants of the language, the early church that knew the way, went into hiding, and Qumran was decimated. The way had to be completely eradicated. All forms of this way of life were hunted down, destroyed, and brought down to ashes. And because Ishu's teachings were so powerful, Rome had to create a completely different narrative for him, a new name, one that celebrated human sacrifice, one that would exalt religion once again to subjugate the people under a god instead of realizing the divinity that they had within them, as well as submitting to rulers and authorities over them. 
a religion that told them to turn the other cheek and lay down your life as there is no greater love. The teachings that Ishu brought, not Jesus, were through the Hebrews' own historical languages, their spiritual inheritance, the flame letters, light letters, where this concept of spiritual sovereignty would and could become fully actualized. Torah means the covenant of light, and it was written down to teach the people how to flow as water through light. And we got me a hand, we got a hand-me-down version washed of all power, sanitized, some might say another word other than sanitized. It was written in a foreign language that brought about wars, destruction, and death. No wonder. It was void of all life and therefore brought about Babel, chaos. And when it was presented to us again in its Hebrew form, the modern day rabbis insisted that it must be taken as the plain literal text, once again denying the power in its literal surface form. Much like when scientists of the past were led to the conclusion that there was an original design in creation, but then were told that it, it cannot be that. And they were told that over and over and over again until they would abandon their findings and adopt theories instead. Which is really Greco-Roman influence in everything. It is all about control. English will never and can never convey the esoteric white fire from above. Messages, frequencies, resonance from beyond that then has to be communicated and put into the black fire, the condensed and restricted form as a language. English, it's impossible to do so. But it was written in a language that had resonance, vibratory frequency that affects matter. We are made of that matter. It was never meant to be translated into Greek or Latin or any other form than the original languages were translated into. See, in Hebrew and Aramaic, every letter of every word has deep mysteries associated with them. And when studying and teaching and examining and excavating, they literally embed within. And then, more appropriately, they activate the language that is already in the DNA. It's like a code that ignites a code within to turn on things. So one Hebrew word can contain several paragraphs of information, and instead, when it gets translated, we might get one to three words out of a paragraph. So much is lost, meaning nothing is gained. We were given a form of godliness that denies the power. The power is in the language of the tongue, and not just any tongue, the Akkadian Chaldean flame letters. You know the symbology in the upper room during Pentecost, which is Greek for 50 days, connected to Jubilee, and it says that tongues of fire were upon their heads? <laughs> All of the Hebrew and Aramaic writings are allegorical, littered with some historical moments in there as well. So in the upper room, they did not literally have tongues of fire upon their heads. They had the language of flame letters that lifted their heads, a word that means sovereignty, the languages of fire and light that brought about a spiritually sovereign movement of first fruits, leaders that had riven, risen out of their poverty state and poverty mindset, like changing their spin from the entropic state of being into the negentropic state of being. This was true freedom from all forms of tyranny. They were being taught the native tongue of spiritual unity out of the oppression of Greek philosophy, moving out of their head, thinking into their heart feeling, out of the Greco-Roman mindset indoctrination. This was revolutionary. This is revolutionary. There is only one problem with this though. People love slavery because it's the path of least resistance. It's easier to go with the flow of that which is around you than stand up and go upstream. People would rather be told what to do than figure out what to do with their freedom. When you are a sovereign, you are responsible for all your words and all your deeds. 
and when you're under a government or under a god there is always a scapegoat to blame most are truly afraid of freedom freedom because they do not know what it is or even how to navigate it they have lived in some sort of slavery their whole lives whether it's government debt you know monetary medical etc education it can take many forms and in this country where I'm sharing from it has been sold to us under the pretense of the American dream we have entered into the 50th year a Jubilee in September of 2022 it has been 2500 years since a Jubilee was called and assembled a trumpet was sounded and a blast from a mountain peak and a sovereign assembly was called this year few heard it few responded but the call was clear and supernatural things occurred while we were in Crestone Colorado cloud by day and fire by night truly it is a return to the power a return of the message of the way through the sacred languages of light fire that leads to spiritual sovereignty finally Roman oppression will cease to control from the Septuagint to Latin to English the seed of Rome is coming down it has started and it will not be stopped the light has come the inheritance is for the cult those who hear the call and respond those who are wanting liberation many are called and few choose the way this year a cry was heard once again let my people go it was in plain sight plain in hearing I literally I heard it everywhere I heard it on American Ninja Warrior yes I do watch that show I find it fascinating I heard it on so you think you can dance one of my favorite shows it rang out so clearly it was as if Hillel was pray, proclaiming let's go let's go it was an anthem that wasn't even being consciously shared but I heard it and instead of let's go I heard let us go let us go can you hear it is it calling you I know that this was a long heart share today I know you may not take the time to listen to this but if you did thank you when I got this revelation it was probably one of the greatest revealing moments I have ever had now I know why I have such a fire within me to share about the sacred languages because it's the exact same fire that Ishu had and why he shared it with his brethren and his sisters it is the same reason why that revolution took place I know I'm not the only one sharing the languages <laughs> that would be very arrogant because this really isn't about me it is about the movement that can shift everything but it is only for the brave and the courageous who are not content with status quo it is for those who want to be the change and are about peaceful resolve that does not give in to tyranny of any form silent warriors of reformation they may never make a sound they will just be and it will move mountains. Shalama Shalom, Chadutha, and Halevah.